Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Daily Dis- I got my addictions and my problems. Bitch, you have an easy life! Ah! Welcome everyone to the Daily Dizzle for Thursday, March 10th, 2011. Tommy Dizzlemitz here with you as always. Uh, yeah, we took another couple days off. Uh, it's been a very, very busy week. Uh, and we actually have fans to notice this time. So uh, thank you very much for that at least. Uh, we'll try not to drop off again. We've just got a lot planned for the next couple months. Uh, but just know if you keep following us, you'll have the latest details on all the crazy crap that we're going to have going on. Uh, so let's jump right back to the weekend. Let's just uh, get the estimates over with. I can say ahead of time, my man crush Topher Grace didn't even make the top 10, which is why it's so difficult for me to report the earnings, uh, only for the fact that up until now, win a date with Ted Hamilton was this his biggest bomb, and uh, now Take Me Home Tonight's not even going to make half of that one. So uh, yeah, let's, let's run down the numbers before I get myself too upset by Topher. Uh, so number one for the weekend was Rango, Johnny Depp's latest movie. It actually had the biggest opening of the year so far, opening to just north of 38 million. A lot of people pegged it for 4D just because, oh, it's an animated movie with Johnny Depp, but it didn't have the 3D ticker price on it. Actually very comparable to the opening of How to Train Your Dragon last year. How to Train Your Dragon ended up having like 5 million more, though, because of the fact that it had 3D going for it. Uh, just under that, at number two, we had the Adjustment Bureau, Matt Damon's latest opening to $21 million, uh, which is better than they expected. Uh, they they kind of took time on it so they could advertise it right, because it is uh, apparently a crazy, nonsensical story at the center of it all. Uh, meanwhile, number three goes to Beastly, Vanessa Hudgens' uh, retelling of Beauty and the Beast, which actually ended up making its budget back uh, before it was even released in America. Uh, so even though it made just shy of $10 million for the weekend, that's $10 million more than they expected that it would do. Uh, so it's already clear on its way to making lots and lots of money. Uh, rounding out the rest of the top ten were the holdovers. Uh, last week's number one haul pass ended up dropping to number four. Didn't have a huge drop, dropping under 35%, uh, but still just not having a huge total, sitting at $27 million after the weekend. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be another heartbreak kid for the Ferrelli brothers, and they really got to try and do something special to get their uh, magic back, which maybe that proposed idea for a Jim Carrey uh, featured Dumb and Dumber sequel it could be the thing to reinvigorate their careers. Number five for the weekend was Nomi and Juliet. I actually got the chance to see it the other day. If you haven't seen it, it's actually very entertaining. They open the movie up straightforward being like, this is a story you've heard. A lot. And then they go from there and make it very interesting. And if that's not enough to convince you, uh, you've got Michael Caine doing a voice in it. Uh, you have both Professor Xavier's, James McAvoy and Patrick Stewart, sharing a scene together. And if that's not good enough, Jason Statham does a voice of a little known bad guy. Jason Statham, like the transporter and handsome Rob. If, if if Handsome Rob as a gnome isn't enough to sell you on this movie, then you have no soul. And plus, if you've ever heard any Elton John stuff, it, it, it's his project. So even if you don't hear one of his songs, you're at least guaranteed to hear a 10-second snippet from like Benny and the Jets or any of his other classics, which is actually awesome, works very well from the music, and uh, makes me happy just because Elton John's all over the place in High Fidelity. So I, I feel that, that R-rated movie and this kid's movie can share something in common together. Number six ended up going to Liam Neeson, an unknown with six and a half million dollars. Its total sits at over 55 million altogether at this point. Uh, so pretty much the Liam Neeson effect continues, which is essentially if you have Liam Neeson karate chopping and kicking ass in your movie, you're gonna double your budget at the very least. So like, give it another decade, and even though he's gonna be, you know, adding on years at that point, He's definitely going to be like the white version of Denzel Washington, where you just throw him your money if you want to show that, hey, this movie's pretty decent. Uh, number seven, Adam Sandler, just go with it. Added just shy of six and a half million. 
It's sitting at over 88 million though altogether, so you can guarantee it's going to cross 100 million in the next couple weeks as long as there's not some very, very steady drop off that can't be accounted for. Number eight goes to the Oscar winning King's Speech. It dropped only 15% for this weekend, adding another 6.2 million. Uh, if you actually check out the record books, uh, normally movies, since they drop off after they come out, you haven't seen a lot of holdover movies that have held on to the number one spot since, like, Titanic and Avatar. But uh, The King's Speech is actually making some uh, pretty impressive records as uh, it's been out of the box office for 15 weeks, and it's having at least one of the strongest weekends for being at that point in its run compared to any other movies. Uh, so it's at least worth noting that, hey, this is a leggy motherfucker right here, uh, despite the fact that it's not the greatest subject matter and you thought it would drop off a little bit quicker than that. At number nine, you had I Am Number Four adding another $5.7 million. However, with under $50 million after three weeks at the box office, it's probably uh, really okay at this point to compare it to Jumper and say, I don't think there's going to be I Am Number 4 too. Wouldn't that be I Am Number 6? Anyways, uh, rounding out the top 10, Justin fucking Bieber! The concert flick added another $4.2 million to its total, so it's sitting at around $70 million altogether. Unfortunately, uh, having surpassed Michael Jackson and uh, Hannah Montana, Justin Bieber is now the highest grossing concert film. That's fucked up. And of course, as we said, failing to make the top 10. Coming right in at number 11, we had Topher Grace's latest movie, Take Me Home Tonight. Uh, the problem with that is uh, it was made at the height of 80s nostalgia, which kind of swept through Hollywood, you know, five years ago. Uh, so it's been sitting on the shelf completed since 2007, bouncing titles, bouncing studios. At least it finally saw the light of day, even though it's not going to make much change in the long run. However, uh, due to the fact that it only costs $10 million to even acquire for Relativity, it should at least make some money back on DVD. The one question I have for Relativity, though, is, alright, so you're a movie company that's only come out in the last couple months, and you've only had three movies come out. Two of them have bombed, and the other one was a bad Nicolas Cage movie that did okay for bad Nicolas Cage movies, but still did not establish you as, oh, we're a company that can do legitimate movies. Now, I'm not putting any blame on Relativity, per se. I mean, it is a movie that people expected to have these results in the long run. However, uh, it's the same principle as why a movie studio won't release one movie one week and another the next week unless they're two very, very different type of genres. It's the fact that you don't want to be cutting into your own profits. You don't want to throw out one movie now and be like, oh, all right, we got to put the other one out. How do we How do we advertise it? How do we make sure that this one kicks the crap out of the other one? But really, to me, I think the most telling sign of all is when I went to my local theater, which, you know, will have the movie title and then we'll also have the show times right under it. And one's in bigger font than the other. Take Me Home Tonight didn't even get the special font treatment. It had the crappy little font, and I'm like, what? So I don't know if that's intentional or what, but if it is... Fuck you, Relativity. And if it wasn't, sorry. So there you have the box office wrap-up from this past weekend. If there's anything that you could learn from it, hopefully it's that you should go make time to go see Take Me Home tonight in the next week before you don't have a chance to see it in theaters. And moving from one thing we wanted to talk about to another, good old Charlie Sheen. Uh, apparently he hasn't been able to wait for our good news, bad news segment as he's been taking his assault to the world directly onto everyone. Um, doing his own broadcasting show on Skype or whatever. You got Charlie's Corner. You have Stars Network wanting to pick it up now that he's out of work. Uh, and even though it's uh, news that has been covered, uh, it's worth covering once more because some people don't get the full details on it. So we do have a good news, bad news segment for today. Let's start on the bad news side of things for Charlie. Uh, it, it's actually kind of a good news if you look at the fact that he might like his free time. But on the bad news side of things, he is out of work at this point as he has been fired from Two and a Half Men. Uh, sometimes when, if you have one man holding up production on things or one man being the source of why you're holding up production on things, uh, if he's putting everyone else out of work you know, who depends on that job, you got to try and fix things as soon as possible. And apparently the only fix for this one was getting rid of Charlie. However, 
Uh, on the good news side of things is uh, Charlie really knows how to put some fine print in his contracts. He's got a Michael J. Fox clause on his two and a half men contract. Anyone who doesn't know what that is, uh, Michael J. Fox, when he was on Spin City, he had to leave eventually because, of... yeah, I'm awful, but that's the truth. Uh, he had to leave, so he had a clause in his contract that even if he left the show, he would still get paid. So, despite the fact that Charlie Sheen has such a huge uh, per episode payday, and they knew that if they got rid of him, they'd still have to guarantee it to him, that didn't seem to matter. So, uh, at the very least, Charlie Sheen is going to be getting paid $2 million an episode to not have to do a goddamn thing anymore. I want to be him so bad right now. Now, what could be the only thing crazier than throwing free money at Charlie Sheen to keep doing the show that probably won't even be as successful without him around anymore? Well, why not pay some people in this family, too, at the same time? One of the people rumored to be uh, coming in to take over for Charlie Sheen and replace the character with a new role is his father, Martin Sheen. So uh, it would be very interesting to see what kind of war of words goes on when you've got the father taking a TV role away from the son. So of course, as the latest details come out about either side of that story, we will have the follow-up for you, whether it's when Two and a Half Men starts production on the next season, or when Charlie Sheen goes even more crazy. Though at this point, he's just starting to readily admit it every so often that he's going insane. So uh, maybe that's going to be sooner rather than later on his side of things. But that's all the time and all we've got for today's Daily Dizzle. But be sure to check back tomorrow. We may have been spotty, but we'll definitely be back for the consistent updates. We'll have a preview of this weekend's box office. And on top of that, we'll have some of the latest movie news. And we should also have a review of uh, tonight's awesome, awesome public event going on near Dizzleville up in Glens Falls, New York. They'll be uh, getting a stop from... TNA, Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. I don't watch it, but I've got nothing to do on a Thursday night. And it seems like a pretty good idea to go get drunk and be a heckler. So uh, I'm sure that we should have some kind of follow-up tomorrow. So if this is your first time checking out Daily Dizzle, don't forget to keep checking back. You can click the username DizzleMits or go to YouTube.com slash DizzleMits to give us a subscription keep up on all the latest videos where we're usually here Monday through Friday when we're not feeling like taking some lazy days and we also have a weekend update as well when Topher Grace isn't losing at the box office so be sure to check back tomorrow there should be some very fun fallout from tonight's redneck wrestling event for the Daily Dizzle I'm Tommy Dizzlemitz we will see you on Friday